Good morning, this is Angela with Parker's Housefrau. Welcome back for my regular Friday video. Today, I wanna to share with you some of my organizational skills here in the kitchen. Now, being a homemaker is about being frugal, being about a manager of your home. It's about providing for your family. And for me, the heart of all of that is really in the kitchen. I bake pretty much every single day. I make bread, some kind of yeasted bread every single day. And I make a lot of quick breads and cakes and things like that for our family of six plus my dad. Now I did a video a while back on how I organize my upright freezer. That was a viewer request and Y'all had a lot of good comments on that video, and so I thought maybe I would go through some other parts of the house and talk about my organizational system in those various places. So today I wanna to focus on my baking station here as a portion of my pantry that I utilize on a daily basis. Now, there are lots of tips and tricks that I use in order to trim the budget, to stay organized, and to help me be successful as a baker. I find that if my pantry is really organized and everything is in a proper place, I am much more likely to bake for my family every day. Now, obviously, this is just the baking portion. This is not my entire pantry for my whole kitchen, but I think that because this is such a unique and important corner of my home that I use on such a regular basis and that I've taken the time to kind of reshape and redesign for peak efficiency and um, peak frugality that I think that it's uh, something that you might find useful and you may be able to glean some tips from yourself. Okay, so first let's look at where this baking station is positioned in the house. Now we have a 1922 kind of farmhouse style and it has all of these kind of vintage 1940s cabinets, 1940s, 50s cabinets that I absolutely love. I know a lot of people think that that's kind of like old fashioned looking. I don't want a modern kitchen. I like things being a little bit old timey. I hate these kind of, I think these are Ikea knobs that the previous owner put on and I just haven't had it in the budget to replace them all around the kitchen because I have tons of kitchen cabinets, but eventually I want to replace all of these because I hate them. So this house came with a baking station. In fact, it has a pull out flour bin down here and these ugly original countertops here. And on top of that, I put a breadboard that my dad had made for my mother. I use this every day. It is a wonderful reminder of my mother who also loved to bake. And it's such a useful surface. It elevates the counter a tiny bit because I'm very tall. And the counters here are all, again, circa 1940s, 50s counters, and they're a little short for me. So I love having like a little extra half inch, hurts my back a little bit less. And this is such a great surface for kneading bread. So I use it all the time. I keep my bread flours here. Normally these are both full and I buy bread flour in bulk in 50 pound bags and I keep the extra under uh, the table in my breakfast nook in a storage tub and then I refill these whenever I need to refill them. And on top of them I keep, well this is just a doily, but on top of them I keep my clean uh, linen tea towels that I put over my bowls of bread as they're rising. So those are right at hand. I also have my dough cutter here, which my neighbor Melissa gave to me. It's much better than my old one, really sharp and nice. I keep my rolling pins here. I have my marble pin and my pastry pin, cookie rack, some small cutting boards. Um, right now I also have some granola here, the last little bit of granola that I made for my kids. So that's what lives on the counter. I try to have it as clutter free as possible, but I also know that I use the flour on a daily basis and these big canisters are best accessible under here. So up high, I store my specialty pans like springform pans and bunt pans and things like that. Uh, odd shaped pans that I only use rarely, but are definitely, you know, baking focused. This is the main cabinet where I kind of store all my goods. So let's take a look in here. Again, old kitchen, creaky floor, creaky cabinets. So stepping back, the first thing you might notice is there are a lot of glass jars. And that's because glass jars are bug proof. If you buy some kind of specialty flour and it particularly for buying some kind of imported specialty flour, there are probably gonna be bug eggs in it and you might end up with pantry moths. If you have sealed glass jars, 
those pantry moths can't get out. And also they can't move from jar to jar. So I buy old fashioned cur and ball jars at the thrift store that are no longer really recommended for canning. And I use those. Some of them you can see have the really old fashioned lids on them. These actually were somebody in my neighborhood had them, a whole box of them uh, in front of their house in a free pile. So I took them, cleaned them really well, and I've been using those. And I also save old um, salsa jars, old jam and jelly jars, and I reuse all of those. So glass jars, that's my number one tip. It will reduce stress. I have not had pantry moths in my kitchen in 20 years probably because I put everything in glass. And, and yes, pantry moths can chew through plastic bags and things like that. So, okay, so first I wanna keep everything where I can easily access it when I need it. And that means I keep all of my uh, leavenings down here on the bottom. So I have baking powder, baking soda, and yeast all on the bottom. Also all my baking spices, all of my sweet baking spices, my savory spices that I use for main dishes and veggie dishes and meat dishes, those are over in another part of the kitchen. But things like cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, vanilla, I have all of those in here and I buy them in bulk and I reuse jars. You can see this one, whole close 2006, but I just buy them in bulk where it's much, much cheaper and I reuse the jars. Now where you are, your grocery store may allow you to bring in empty spice jars and um, fill directly into them. Like if you have a local food co-op, unfortunately our local grocery store does not. So this is an area where I have not totally eliminated plastic waste because like when I refill my ginger and put it in this old honey jar, I have to get it in a plastic um, baggie and then put it in here. So it's not ideal. Um, problems of living in a consumer society that's not set up for sustainability. So it's definitely imperfect and I wish I could do different, but nobody around me will let me directly fill into any of these jars. If you're wondering why I don't keep salt, even though I need it over in my baking station, it's because my eldest daughter and I had this little running joke about how folks always have a spice rack and we wanted a mineral rack for all of the different kinds of salt I collect and use on a regular basis. So this was just a little free um, cabinet that I took the doors off of that someone was throwing away. It was a hideous kind of streaked gray color and I painted it and my daughter made a little sign underneath. So all of my salts stay here next to the stove, which is just right across the doorway from my baking station. So I just reach over here and grab a salt when I need one. Okay, so spices, leavening, yeast all live on the bottom shelf. The other things that live here are things I use on a really regular basis when I'm baking bread. Oats, potato flakes, cornmeal, powdered milk. All of those live down here because I use them pretty much every day. My go-to roll recipe uses potato flakes and powdered milk. My go-to sandwich bread recipe uses oats and powdered milk, and obviously all of them use yeast. My go-to muffin recipe, oats. So the things I use most often are on the bottom shelf here. So having all of these things, these are all items I buy in bulk. And because they're visible out front, I know when I'm starting to get low on things. For example, this is all of the blue cornmeal I have left. I use blue cornmeal a lot. It cooks up into a beautiful lavender color in galettes and things like that. And so I use it a lot in the summer when I'm baking with fresh fruit. Now, the only place in town that sells blue cornmeal is Bob's Red Mill, which is quite a bit a ways away from me. So I have a running list of things for when I make a run to Bob's Red Mill. This is on my list of things to get. But otherwise, I notice when my potato flakes are going down and once the jar gets about half empty, I'm paying attention for those sales at the grocery store. Now over here in the corner, I keep all of my dried fruit, dates and cherries and prunes and things like that because those are sweets and I use them in quick breads and things like that and also for fresh snacking. For slicing my sourdough, that lives down here. 
So the second shelf, obviously all my homemade jams and jellies live in this cabinet. It's probably not ideal. I maybe should have them down with my regular canned goods. But because um, I do a lot of my canning prep over here as well, because sugar and things like that live in this area, I tend to keep my homemade jams and jellies here. This is quince jam, for example. Um, this is grape. Back here is plum, things like that. Okay. Next to the jams and jellies are all of my sugars. So I have my brown sugar, behind it white sugar, specialty sugars because I do love to bake a lot of pastries. And so I have things like non-melting sugar, sanding sugar that I can sprinkle on top of cakes or muffins to make them feel a little bit extra special for the kids. Uh, yes, I do use white sugar. And um, this is actually organic, um, sustainably produced. But because of our budget, I buy my brown sugar and my white sugar just in bulk at the local grocery store. Next to that, I keep all of my nuts. Walnuts, these are walnuts grown in my dad's yard that we harvested. I have a huge bag of these walnuts if you keep them in the shell. We'll keep for at least three years if you keep them cool. Once you shell them, they go rancid within six months to a year. Same thing, I buy my nuts in bulk, sunflower seeds, pecans, hazels. I buy them in fairly small quantities because they don't keep, and I do wait and buy them on sale. All of my oils, things like balsamic reduction that I made, those live over here because I use them for baking. Top shelf is things I use less often. I do use molasses a lot, and you can see I buy it when it's on sale. So even though I have three quarters of a jar left, I buy molasses when it's on a good sale. Baking cocoa, I use a lot. Chocolate chips, and these are some butterscotch chips that I had to buy for a recipe, and then my kids don't really like them. All of my sprinkles live up here for baking, and uh, hot cocoa for my kids. And then a few jamming supplies, like funnel and um, a rack for lids and jar lifters. Those live back in this corner and some extra canning lids. Now, another tip here is that I have the inside of my door, I have some cheat sheets. And um, I made these cheat sheets, oh gosh, ages ago and then recently redid them because eventually they get kind of like food splatter on them and they just get kind of dingy looking. So I recently redid all of these and these are the six recipes I use most frequently. And I would like to say that I have them all memorized and I do, but sometimes my brain just gets like a little bit befuddled and I'm kind of second guess myself about the baking temperature or the quantity of something. So it's really nice for those recipes you use all the time to have cheat sheets on the inside. It's not a complete a recipe with directions. It's just enough for me to walk through those recipes with which I'm quite familiar. Potato rolls, these are my kids' favorite. I have a video about them you should check out. I make oatmeal muffins all the time and I will probably do a video on these too. I have a homemade recipe that I really love and is really versatile and uses whatever we have on hand, homemade applesauce, pear sauce, roasted mashed pumpkin, things like that. So I can swap in and out. I love versatile recipes where I can swap in and out. This is the King Arthur Big Batch Roll Recipe. It makes 24 large rolls, quick and easy. They rise really fast. And then up top I have kind of my go-to two sandwich breads that I make a lot, a potato egg bread. When we are in the middle of summer and our ducks and chickens are laying a ton, I try to switch into a homemade bread recipe that lets me use up two eggs every day. In the winter, when I have a shortage of eggs, I use this oatmeal sesame bread recipe where there are no eggs in the recipe. So I try and cook seasonally with what is available as well as what I can get on sale. So uh, I do swap out kind of my go-tos throughout the year. Obviously, this is just a basic no-need um, sourdough-ish bread, um, the, like artisan bread in five minutes a day kind of a bread. So I just have those little cheat sheets. Now you might ask Angela, where are your specialty flowers? They live down here in this flower bin in um, containers down there. Things like triticale flour and whole wheat flour and rice flour. 
and I don't buy those in large quantities because again, those are things I want to keep and they go bad quickly. So I buy them in just enough quantity to use efficiently, um, however much I need for recipes so that none goes to waste. Okay, so let's reiterate. When we have an organized baking station, it makes us much more likely to engage in the act of baking. If you have a clean kitchen, clean kitchen counters, jars of ingredients that are all highly visible and organized, you are going to be much more likely to start baking from scratch. If you have to clean off the counters, if you have to hunt for the ingredients, if you have to pray they haven't gone off or gotten pantry mods, then you're not really likely to get into the routine of baking. It's going to be a, a bigger hurdle to overcome to start engaging in that process. So the first step for me, get your baking station set up, organized, and you are going to be much more of a successful baker and you're going to fold it into the routine of your life. Now, the second thing is that everything is in glass jars. I buy things in appropriate quantities, things that go off more quickly, I buy in smaller quantities, things I use frequently, I buy in bulk when they are on sale. And I am sure to check my quantities. I have easy to view jars that let me know when I'm getting low and I either need to refill from the storage tub under my breakfast nook table or I need to go to the store. I don't buy if they're not on sale. I keep my spices that I use most often for baking in a separate location than my spices that I use for side and main dish cooking because I don't want to be walking all the way across the kitchen. Sometimes I'll just be like, oh, my hands are kind of covered in dough and I don't want to go through that. I just, I'll just leave the cinnamon out. If it's right here, I'm going to use it. If it's in sight and in reach, I'm going to utilize it. Keeping things I use less up high especially uh, specialty pans I rarely use, ingredients I use less often like sprinkles, stay up high. Things that I use the most often are to the front and down right in front of my face, right within reach. I keep a cheat sheet so that I don't have to look up on my phone or with floury hands have to go look up in a cookbook a recipe that I thought I had committed to memory. So just make enough quick notes that I know what is going to get me through the recipe. I have the recipe fairly ingrained in my memory, but it's really nice to have a cheat sheet. And that makes me much more likely again to be successful. With our homemaking, we want to be frugal. We want to provide for our household. We want to enjoy the vocation that we have undertaken. And we want to promote a way of living that is sustainable in terms of the way we interact with the environment, but also sustainable in terms of in the context of our real lives. So making baking sustainable in my real life and as much as I possibly can within the setup of the commerce system in my part of the world, um, Having an organized baking station provides that extra boost that helps that sustainability be possible. As always, thank you for watching today. I hope that you got something out of this video that it was informative for you. I hope that if you are interested in incorporating more home baking into your homemaking or for folks who aren't homemakers, if you are just interested in undertaking more of the production of your own food and the nourishing of your household in that way, that this video helped give you some encouragement and some practical advice. As always, these videos are not yet monetized, so if you are interested in supporting the work of Park Rose Hausfrau and my main channel, Park Rose Permaculture, you can check out my PayPal down in the description and also my Patreon. I will be back next Friday. Thank you.